Hey everybody, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Just barely getting this uh, last of this five uh, review block finished just a couple of days before it is set to go out. So, let's cover a few books, what do you say? Let's very quickly finish off 1373, The Year of Rogue Dragons, with a book that I have no idea if it belongs there, so we probably have already finished off 1373. No date that I could find in the book or uh, on on the uh, the reference sheet that we're using. Never's Fall, another one of the um, totally blanking, but like Obsidian Ridge, the Citadels, another one of the Citadels books. I just could not get into this at all. Um, ostensibly, it is... Yeah, kind of a, a smaller force added to a larger force, and the the small and and they're all going to clear out the citadel. So it sounds like it could be decently fun, but just something about Ed Gentry's writing style, I just it, it's like the opposite of clicked with me. I don't know what would be the opposite of a click. Uh, kilk, it kilked with me, so I did not get very far in that at all. Didn't think the plot sounded horrible. Thought it could be funny. I mean, it could. It sounded a lot like uh, uh, Crypt of the Moaning Diamond, something like that, that could be done well. Uh, you know, so I'm not against what it was trying to achieve, I think. Who knows? It could have completely changed after when I stopped reading it. But as far as I got, that's what it was about. And his writing style just did not work for me. 1374. We're going to move into the year of lightning storms. Woo! <laughs> we're, for a while here, we're going to get like one year done per block of these readings, which is fine by me. Um, I don't have anything dedicated one way or the other here. So uh, let's talk about Ghostwalker by Eric Scott Debye. I have been very excited to read uh, Debye or Debye. I honestly don't know. I'm going to keep saying Debye, however. I've been very excited about Debye's stuff because he uh, he's one of the people who uh, is more active in talking over on Candlekeep forums and... Uh, I've heard that one of his books, the the Dungeons book that he did, is kind of Saw in the Realms, and this one is kind of uh, uh, The Crow, uh, though he says it's much more like Pale Rider, things like that, which are, of course, very similar kind of spirit of vengeance. I will say this book shows a lot of kind of first novelitis, I guess, if you will. It seemed not as sure of itself as it could have been. There were a lot of things like that that kind of frustrated me, but I loved the concept so much that I just stuck with it through to the end. The concept, of course, being kind of a remake of The Crow. I have no idea if this whole Ghost Walker business has any footing in the realms. I mean, sure, it, you, you could do it, but, you know, uh, as far as, like, would it work in a game system? I guess this brings up the question, and I, I want to look at, uh, kind of, at the end of this, in general sort of where we are with the realms as a whole here. I'm thinking like maybe the fifth out of these little five uh, section blocks, we should look at that. You know, where is the realms in general? Is everything feeling cohesive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? How much do we care? Uh, whatever. But a question that's also worth asking is, do these relate at all to the gaming system anymore? Let's handle that a little bit later, however. Let's just talk about the kind of plot and the, the mechanics and everything for right now. We'll get to that in a bit. So the point that I was trying to make earlier is that this novel isn't necessarily the best written or the most entertaining, but the idea itself is so entrancing to me that I found myself just pushing through no matter what. And it's not necessarily that it's bad. Uh, it, it just feels like it, it's a little stumbly in places, and there's a decent amount of padding, especially in the second act. But I felt like it kind of pulled everything together for the climax, which took some interesting turns. Not exactly unexpected or shocking, but interesting. A couple of things I wanted to point out. I actually made some notes of quotes from both of the books we're mainly talking about here today that I, I liked, that I thought I would share. So this is uh, uh, the kind of main villain of the piece, or I don't, I don't know, the, the villain that incites all the incidents, but not exactly the main villain. How can you believe in heroism, screamed Great. How can you believe in heroism when the heroes you worship are murderers such as your beloved Walker, men who seek vengeance over justice, violence over peace, death over life? And this, to me, made me think of the Erebus Kale trilogy. You know, it's like Erebus Kale and Walker in this one are both very, uh, they're, they're darker heroes than we're in general used to seeing. That whole argument, I, I mean, I guess it makes sense because it's from the villain's point of view and he doesn't see everything that we're seeing, but that whole kind of idea is kneecapped 
by the fact that the kind of purpose of this is like, oh, he finds love again, and la 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 la. And I was really happy that at least the ending stayed true to what really should be the inevitable ending. I mean, it, it kind of took this detour there, but it did stay true, and, and it still ended I, not, not exactly tragically, because I thought it, it, it did a good job of kind of playing around with this, you know, the idea of, well, their love was, the, the, the main two characters, their, the main two protagonists, I should say, their love is doomed to fail, but does that matter? I mean, technically all loves are doomed to fail, right? So should you just say no if love rears up? Uh, or shouldn't you enjoy what you can out of it, even if it's not completely fulfilling? And I, I really liked that it, it, it not only was that idea brought up, but it, it, uh, Debbie didn't short shrift that idea. I really did end up liking that, even though I hated that subplot when it first reared its head. So, good job there, I think. But in any case, that whole, that little speech that Greg gives, I think really brings up, like, you know, it's like we're in the gritty 80s of comics now. It's like everybody's read Watchmen and thinks, like, oh, that's cool, I have to do my own gritty retake on stuff. And, you know, of course, that's not the point. You want interesting characters. That's all you should care about. And if they happen to be darker characters, then you run with that, because that's what they are. This, I thought, did a good job of being dark, but not needlessly so, just as Erebus, the whole reason that his darkness is interesting is because he's struggling with it through the whole way, you know. It's it's Jack is his humanity, and he holds on to that as much as he can, which is why I'm so excited to see where the, the next books take him, because Jack's been taken away, so it's like, well... How does he deal with that, right? Anyway, don't want to <laughs> keep harping on Erebus Kale. I'm sure you can tell, really enjoyed Kemp's stuff. And to be, I think, you know, you know uh, as I talked about Shadow's Witness, I think is, is much weaker than the other stuff. I think to be has the possibility of getting to where uh, Kemp was at the end of the Erebus Kale trilogy. So very excited to see where this author goes, though I didn't necessarily love uh, this novel amazingly so, but I, I didn't think it was bad at all. One other thing from this book that I wanted to bring up is uh, the main paladin uh, chick who falls for the main protagonist, Walker, has with her uh, a couple of kind of, I, I assume they're paladins as well, a couple of, you know, uh, uh, her underlings or henchmen or whatever you want to call them. And their names, I think, are Bars and Durst. But one of them, I believe, is a half-orc. And the other one, I believe, is human, but I'm not sure which is which, and I'm not even sure if that is right. And that's something that I wanted to talk about that I've been seeing a lot. The only other one specifically that I remember is from the Year of Rogue Dragons. There was kind of the wacky comedy duo of Will and Pavel. And I think one of them was a halfling and one of them was a dwarf, but I don't know which, because it never became clear to me, and it, it never felt like they were written as anything more than comedy duo, and it doesn't matter which one is which. And and I just wanted to say, I find that kind of frustrating, because as much as I enjoyed their repartee uh, both places, as much as I, I... Though Pavel and Will, three books was a bit too much. But, you know, as much as I enjoyed uh, their back and forth in at least the first book, out of both of these. I don't I don't think any of Debbie's stuff sequels this uh, or brings any of these characters back, but who knows. It gets frustrating after a while when you realize, I have no idea which voice is which, and I can't tell them apart. I figure in the spirit of full disclosure, I must say that this could possibly just be from me being a lazy reader if I'm not 100% into something, or even if I am. I, I remember reading the first Malazan book and absolutely loving the interplay between Kalam and Quick Ben, and when I saw some fan art, I saw that everybody drew both of the characters as uh, black, having black skin. And I was like, you know, I, I don't have a problem with that, but that's so weird. Why would they just assume that? And then I went back, and the second time I read the book, I noticed that every other friggin' line is like, you know, Kalam's ebon skin was uh, barely distinguishable from the night around him, and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's part of why he's such a great assassin, and it's like... Boy, I just I just suck at uh, reading stuff like that. And I'll, I'll, I'll admit, I mostly pay attention to dialogue. I, I don't know if that's because I kind of have more of a, a film background, but I read more books before I got into film, so I, I don't know. But so maybe it's just me. I'm curious, does anybody else feel that way? Did they feel like those characters were indistinguishable? Does anybody know whether pa what race Pavel and Will were, specifically which one, without having to look it up? 
you know, like Salvatore stuff, as, as, as much as I might uh, rip on it here and there, I, I know exactly what race every character in that damn party is. Um, and, and like, Brunor and Regis have, you know, this back and forth between them, and I know that Brunor's a dwarf, and Regis is a halfling. Now, does he perhaps oversell it at times and have Brunor say things like, you damn half-witted halfling, rah, 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 you know, and oh, you stodgy dwarf. Yes, pro- probably. But it works, you know, it, 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 at least for the first book, it really worked to put them into my head that way. So I think there's a fine line. I just think that the uh, some of the books that we're reading recently take it for granted too much that we're going to pay very close attention to the first or second time that that's mentioned and not need it in a way that allows it to sink into our heads. But fairly a small issue. Let's move on to Farthest Reach by... Richard Baker, the first in the last Mythal trilogy. Now, you guys probably know, I'm, I'm sure I've mentioned it before, I really like Richard Baker, and this was no exception. I really enjoyed this, even though it's about elves, and in general, find the elves pretty damn dull. And I think he really sums up why here, uh, in a lot of ways. There's this uh, bit where they're talking about Ebermeet and how it's, you know, it sets itself apart and everything. Somebody says, uh, at one point here, I, I have this... Uh, Oh, apparently, several uh, says this, and I think he's the guy who kind of uh, secedes from Evermeet and takes any volunteers who will go with him to fight this big uh, demon army. And he says, This time it was the Gatekeeper's Crystal. Three years ago it was the treachery of Kimmel Nymason. In a year or two, or ten, it will be something else. We withdrew all our strength from Corman Thor in the retreat and virtually abandoned Faerun to whatever fate the other speaking peoples forged for themselves, and still evil follows us here. Whatever refuge we have found here is little more than a temporary reprieve from the workings of the world beyond. And that quote perfectly sums up why I think the elves are so friggin' stupid in the realms. It's like, oh, I mean, not the ones in Faerun itself, but the ones who go over to Evermeet and why I find them annoying and why I find them uninteresting. It's like, well, of course this doesn't work, you know? I mean... Like, if you eradicated all evil everywhere in the realms, then sure, putting yourself on your little island and being like, we're better than you, would work fine. But you haven't done that. You haven't done any uh, ethnic cleansing, which I think that would be a fun way uh, for the elves of Evermeet to go, to be like, you know, the reason why we can't get any peace and quiet is because of all your yapping, you lesser races. We have to wipe you out. I think, uh, you know, a kind of, ever meet as Rwanda <laughs> sort of uh, plot would be really fun to follow and uh, interesting, but instead we just have all this sort of typical crap where it's like, oh, we're separate and better than you, blah, 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 but of course any time a trouble hits we have to get involved or else that trouble is going to inevitably come to us, especially if it's somebody pissed off at elves, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it just, it, it's like if I from reading fictional books about this world and not having any personal stake in it can see how stupid that is, somebody on this wise elven council should be able to see that, right? I mean, come on. Overall, however, really fun book. A lot of interesting stuff that's going on here and uh, uh, a good setup for the next book. The main elf's name is Arvil, which was a little frustrating because we just had Arvin over in um, House of Serpents, but it's not going to get too confusing for a little bit here. This felt in many ways like a sequel to Troy Deming's Return of the Archwizards. A lot of people mentioned the Fyreem incursion just a few years back, and uh, or maybe even less than that, I can't remember now. Um, so it's like it, it was nice that it was connected to that, it kept making me wonder, however, was Denning originally slated to write this trilogy? Was it maybe meant to do more than it does? I don't know, maybe it does something really big by the end. It's called The Last Mythal, uh, and, and we're setting up, they set up in, in book two, we're going to go to Myth Draenor, so I'm like, oh, maybe this is how Myth Draenor gets back in business, because uh, I know that by a fourth edition it must be, because the... The one fourth edition book that I've read, even part of, was Richard Baker's, uh, uh, oh, the first of that trilogy he did. It's not Corsair, but whatever, the spell, uh, sword mage, something maybe? In any case, the guy there had trained at Myth Draenor, so I'm like, oh, maybe this is, we're gonna set up how Myth Draenor came back, so that'll be interesting. I'm excited about that. This was also very much like Return of the Archwizards in the fact that we kind of keep switching between a much more personal journey 
and a much larger um, um, war epic journey of different elves and how they're dealing with this threat, which is essentially there's this family of elves that were all inbred with, or not, uh, they were not inbred, bred in with demons. Uh, and, and, and so it's their return and them dealing with them. This could have been called Return of the Demon Elves, I guess, instead of Return of the Arch Wizards. I'm hoping that Baker does some more stuff and broadens the scope more than Denning did, since, uh, you know, I had quite a few issues with Denning's Return of the Arch Wizards, but I'm, I'm definitely enjoying where we are here. And I could probably say more about this, but I'm guessing I'll have a chance to say, it, say the same stuff when we get to Book 2 and Book 3. And we're running a little long on what I want the time to be here. My kind of perfect time for these is 10 minutes, but we're way beyond that right now. And I do want to bring up a couple more ideas. First of all, do these have to do at all with the game system right now? You know, like uh, somebody who had read the Shandrill stuff by Ed Greenwood said that none of that stuff is in the rule books. You can't do it, blah, 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 blah. Now, they might have changed that between when he was saying that and now it might have come up. But essentially, at the time that it was written, apparently it wasn't something that related in any way. And and I, I guess I wonder, you know, with Ghostwalker, let's say that that isn't something that's in the rules. Maybe it is, and I just don't remember it. But, I mean, I played a lot of 3rd edition. Maybe it's something specific to the realms. I didn't play any 3rd edition realms. But even if it's not there, do we care? I, I don't think I necessarily do. But I thought it brought up a bigger question, which is what purpose do the novels serve in the grand scheme of things? Now... Some of the things that they produce essentially just, you, you know, there's this, uh, what's it called, that, that that idea of 360 marketing, you know, essentially just get your brand name out wherever you can and get it recognized so that the brand doesn't die, right? And it's like, maybe it's diluted some in some forms, and maybe there's something that's considered corely canonical or whatever, but essentially, as long as you've got it out there, that's what matters. I mean... You know, like the Doctor Who interactive uh, Attack of the Grask or whatever the hell it was that you used your, like, TV remote control to help the Doctor out. That's not something that you would consider canon, but if you spend a half an hour playing it, it's, it's, it's helping to keep the brand alive in people's heads, right? I mean, uh, so it's, it's serving its purpose, even though those of us who are interested in canonicity are driven insane by it. So, what purpose do the novels serve? How canonical are they? And when things disagree, how much do we care? Like, for instance, apparently the fall of Netheril has been portrayed at least three different ways. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. For me, I feel like the novels are more canonical than the game material, and here's why. The game material is is something to help you play the game, and the novels can be as well, but for my money, the game that I play might have uh, events that happen that completely contradict the game that you play, and that's cool because they're both in their kind of parallel realms worlds. You know, like if in my game we kill Mistra and we kill uh, Al, um, <laughs> the, the main god, right? That, that's perfectly fine in a game. And then, uh, you know, I as a game master have to decide how does that affect things and where do I want to go from there and so on and so on and so forth. You might be running a system in which uh, both of those critters are completely and totally alive, functioning well, and, and your guys never even interact with the gods in any meaningful way. And, and that's fine. And so that means that the game material, which is set up to enhance and support both of these games, which can easily contradict each other and it doesn't matter, that to me makes them less canonical. Whereas the novels, which, you know, you, you kind of assume happen in their own shared continuum, that's where things matter more. Is that the case or not? I'm curious to see what do other people think. Uh, that's how I view it. I don't think, you know, so essentially for me, the realm's novels have a higher place in the, uh, you know, it's like, if uh, if we say that Spellfire exists, then okay, it exists. You know, that's the truth. It's just you have to figure out how to put it in your game if you want. In a lot of ways, I, I don't know. Uh, there's so many ways to go with this because it's like, you know, a lot of people want to say the 4th edition is not canon because they really disliked it. 
Does that mean that the fourth edition novels are less canonical than the third edition gaming materials? I don't know. I, I, it's a slippery slope and everything, but I feel that things are fitting together pretty well. And I'll just talk about this briefly here, and hopefully we can talk about it more when we get to the next block of five, uh, however long that might be. I'll let you know I'm... Uh, uh, it's going to be a while, because I'm just starting on one of the two books uh, for next time right now. But I, I really do feel like the realms are kind of cohesing in a way that they uh, started, that they did much more in second edition. Now, granted, they're kind of cohesing in blocks, you know, like there for a while, it felt like we could not escape Sembia to save our lives, right? And, you know, we've had uh, the Year of Rogue Dragons as kind of a core part of this whole section and it doesn't really uh, seem to come up in every book, and that seems a big deal. But it did get mentioned more than once in other books. So that feels like, you know, oh, these things are tying in together. That's cool. And uh, it, it feels like, you know, like House of Serpents is, is fleshing out uh, some area, but it doesn't feel completely different. And, uh, you know, we're now delving back into the elves, but we've been there before and it feels like there's a continuity. They keep bringing up the uh, Return of the Archwizards and Elaine Cunningham's uh, book Evermeet, where it was, uh, where Evermeet was uh, attacked or whatever. So it feels like it's part of continuity. And Elminster's daughter you know, has the kind of core, core mirror. I, I never got that. Was that intentional core mirror uh, stuff? So, uh, you know, I, I feel like everything really feels like we're part of a unified whole. And and you've got the stuff, you know, like the, the rogues or the, the citadels or whatever, and they're very kind of one-off, but they still feel similar enough that I, I think they fit in as well. And so I'm I'm starting to feel... I know there for a while, third edition just kind of felt all over the place, but it feels somewhere right around the Sembian stuff. When that started, we really hit a feeling of like everything does have to do with each other in a way, and I, I'm I'm really digging that. I'm really digging that everything feels kind of sort of connected. We'll see if that keeps up. And again, I don't know if that necessarily matters, but I am kind of enjoying it. Also. Coom is a word. That's what Forsaken House taught me. Coom, C Y M. So, uh, so yeah, uh, good, good, uh, good vocab builder there. That was cool. All right, I have talked for a long time. I will try to shut up now. Everybody, thank you so much. This is Michael T. Bradley. Realms remembered.